Um, I get the pleasure to announce uh, Chris Moxham, the founder and CEO and chief uh, scientific officer of Transcripta Bio. Um, he'll describe how Transcripta Bio is using a platform based approach to discover and advance potential new treatments for Lee syndrome. So I'll pass it off to you, Chris. Great. Thank you, Casey. And, and thanks for accommodating me uh, in, in this part of the agenda. Um, let me just quickly share my hands. Can everybody see the slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. So this is uh, what I'll describe to you in, in the next 15 minutes or so is um, are the results thus far of an N of one trial that we've been conducting uh, in great partnership with Cure Mido and Casey in particular, uh, and with Dr. Seema Kayani at UT Southwestern. Uh, and this is a, a trial we've been conducting in a single patient uh, and now two with omavaloxalone, uh, which is an approved drug uh, now known as Skyclaris. Uh, and this all came about uh, through work that we were doing, uh, both in terms of our platform, where we are screening in cortical neurons, a library of molecules, including FDA approved drugs. Uh, and in the course of our partnership with Curamido, we discovered that omovaloxalone, uh, in fact, induced, as you can see on the left side, the expression of SIRF1, uh, the known root cause gene, uh, in certainly many cases of Lee syndrome. And not only in, in the healthy neurons that we were screening, as shown in the black line, but also in patient-derived uh, neurons uh, from a patient with Lee syndrome. And upon this observation and, and knowing what we know about Skyclaris that was approved in Friedrich's ataxia uh, in Q3 of last year, um, this is now an approved drug with a known safety profile. Um, Casey really had the, the insight uh, and the fortitude to say, look, we've got a 19-year-old patient uh, and 19 year old uh, is important here because Skyclaris was approved uh, at for 16 years and older in Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, and she said, we have a 19 year old patient uh, with known SIRF1 uh, Lee syndrome. Uh, we're partnered with Dr. Kayani. Why don't we uh, take a, a leap here and begin an off-label dosing? And to me, this was a great opportunity to conduct in a way almost uh, considered like an experimental medicine protocol uh, where we could be begin dosing a patient uh, we had made assessments, both neurological assessments and collected blood pre-dosing, where we could begin to look at potential biomarkers. Uh, and then every month, we would do an additional blood draw. Uh, we would do a whole blood RNA sequencing. We would be measuring the exposure or the levels of the drug in the plasma. Uh, and then along the way, there were assessments that were made by both uh, the neurologist as well as the patient's physical therapist. And of course, we also had the impressions from the patient and her, her caregivers, if you will, her parents. Uh, and so what I'm going to share with you now, I'm really excited to share just the, the, the data we've been observing thus far, uh, and I'll share with you the, the next steps that we're contemplating together with, uh, with Kiramido and uh, with UT Southwestern. So the protocol is, is shown here. Again, 19-year-old patient. Um, we were obtaining Skyclaris through a prescription, uh, and so we started the patient on 100 milligrams once daily. Uh, and this was a, a weight-based uh, adjustment in dosing. The approved dose is 150 milligrams per day. Uh, and so we started at 100 milligrams again, based upon the weight-adjusted dosing that we started in December. And so again, moving very quickly, made an observation in July of last year, we started dosing uh, in 23, excuse me, these dates are uh, out of line here. Um, and again, began making assessments in terms of blood-based uh, measurements um, and you'll see that after about uh, a couple months of dosing, we reduced the dose to 50 milligrams. I'll explain why, but I'm happy to say that we've now increased the dose back up to 100 milligrams in this patient. So part of what we were doing with the, the baseline uh, samples that we had from the patient, we did some baseline characterization. Uh, and not surprisingly, when we look at the whole blood RNA sequencing, uh, we see that there is a, in fact, a downregulation of SIRF1 transcripts. Uh, in the blood uh, in this patient compared to a control cohort. Uh, so this is certainly is not surprising, but also confirmatory. Uh, but what we also observed is that there was significant downregulation in many of the genes that are associated with mitochondrial pathways, and particularly pathways associated with oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, and so this just, uh, as a baseline assessment, uh, also gave us an opportunity to understand, well, what happens uh, to the genes associated with mitochondrial pathways, particularly oxidative phosphorylation, as we began dosing with uh, omavaloxalone. 
And so what I'll describe next are some of the pharmacodynamic biomarkers and just in the interest of time, I'm combining some things here. So the first thing we wanted to understand would, from a pharmacodynamic perspective is, do you in fact see time dependent changes in genes that are known to be targets of the NRF2 pathway as omovaloxalone is a known NRF2 activator? And in fact, the answer is yes, we do. Uh, after four months of dosing, clearly we're seeing upregulation of genes, known target genes, of the NR NRF2 pathway, which is consistent with the known mechanism of action of omovaloxalone. In addition, as we start to look at gene expression in, in the whole blood RNA sequencing at these mitochondrial pathways associated with mitochondrial function, uh, we can see again, time dependent and uh, uh, increases in the expression of these genes uh, associated with these mitochondrial pathways. And around the same time of these measurements, we were getting information back from uh, the patient and her parents uh, that you know she was showing signs of improvements in GI motility, that she didn't need a laxative anymore, that her walking was better, her hand tremors had improved, and I'll show you more data around that. She was eating and sleeping better. Uh, and the clinician who had ha been having virtual visits uh, during this time said that the, the patient's speech was more clear. And so again, N of one uh, patient, uh, but what is encouraging is that we're observing, or the patient is observing, as well as the physician, improvement across multiple facets of the known symptomatology of, of Lee syndrome. So as I mentioned, we were measuring um, plasma uh, exposure levels of omovaloxalone uh, from, uh, from the patient. Uh, and this is certainly encouraging one. What we know is that, you know, obviously pre-dosing, there was no drug on board. Uh, after one month of dosing, we we're now in uh, exposure levels, if you will, that were, we know that would in, uh, promote a, a pharmacodynamic effect. Uh, and when you reduce that dose, and I'll explain why, uh, you see a, a concomitant uh, reduction in the plasma exposures. Uh, and so having this assay in place certainly is, is uh, necessary to establish this PK-PD relationship. And the, the plasma exposure levels that we are observing with omovaloxalone were also consistent with the plasma exposure levels that were seen in the clinical trials with uh, omovaloxalone in Friedrich's ataxis. So we're achieving similar levels of, of drug uh, drug levels. So why did we reduce the dose? Uh, and what was observed uh, early on uh, with dosing uh, was that there was an increase in the gene expression of the genes that encode for these liver enzymes, ALT and AST. Uh, and typically when one sees these increases, uh, this is perhaps one of the first signs that there may in fact be liver injury. Uh, that was in fact not the case. Um, and then, in fact, what we reference here is that in the MOXIE study uh, for omovaloxalone and Friedrich's ataxia, uh, here too, there was an observed increase in liver enzymes. Um, and as it was noted with the, the FDA summary around the approval of omovaloxalone, that in fact, there were no signs that this was not evidence of liver injury. In fact, there was no evidence of liver injury. Uh, and as others have written about, these are in fact two target genes for the NRF2 pathway. And so, uh, on one hand, you can consider their increase to be another known pharmacodynamic effect, uh, but certainly out of care and caution, uh, as was, was one of the first patients, the first patient with Lee syndrome dosed with omovaloxalone, um, Dr. Kayani reduced the dose down to 50 milligrams per day. And of course, what you begin to see uh, is that the increases in ALT and AST are reversible. Um, and, uh, and you'll also see that uh, the effects on these uh, NRF2 target genes are also reversible as we reduce the dose. So what we're looking here on the x-axis is the magnitude of change in these target genes. You can see after four months of dosing, there are several that are significantly induced, you know, four to, to eight, uh, 16 fold increases in gene expression. And that expression re is reduced over time as we reduce the dose. And so this patient actually is serving as an excellent control, right? We have pre-dose levels, we've gone to hundred milligrams. Now we back down to 50 milligrams. And you're seeing uh, pharmacodynamic changes that you would, one would expect to see as you modulate uh, drug exposure. Uh, it was also at this time that, uh, the, uh, that the patient had also reported that those benefits that she was observing uh, at the 100 milligram dose level, as we continued on 50 milligrams, that benefit started to recede. Uh, and so I'm happy to say that we've now increased uh, the patient back to 100 milligrams. Uh, we are continuing those assessments um, and so uh, we'll talk more about that. The other thing we noted too, in addition to those NERF2 target genes, is that there were uh, that the increases that we saw in the genes that are encoding for these multiple different mitochondrial pathways 
uh, the, the levels of induction also receded as we uh, dropped the dose. And so again, you have this clear PKPD effect. Uh, and we're really focused now on these mitochondrial pathways as a, as a biomarker uh, for pharmacodynamic uh, evidence of an effect. So what did we start to see clinically? This is one of the, the data uh, scales that was shared with us, uh, this Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. Uh, and what you can see is that um, pre-dosing in November 2023, we had these scores in, in blue. Uh, and you can see that there were increases in each of these uh, behavior scales uh, at that June timeframe. Uh, and so this is encouraging, certainly, again, a N of one scenario. Uh, but you can be uh, read the comments here. Uh, she's had improved balance, uh, improvement in tremors, uh, improved appetite, uh, and improved stamina. The other assessment that was done was the SARA scale, uh, this measurement and assessment of at ataxia. Uh, and you can see for at least two of the, the measures, this nose to finger assessment really is again focused on hand tremors and the alternate hand movements, uh, that there were significant improvements uh, on those scales. Um, and so, uh, again, this is really, I think, very encouraging. Uh, and in terms of next steps, uh, the first patient continues, as I said, at that 100 milligrams per day. We're continuing the assessments, both in terms of the blood draws and make, looking at the blood-based biomarkers, as well as the clinical assessments. It'll be very interesting to see if those markers go back up, as well as whether we see the clinical improvement. Uh, we've also added a second patient uh, in July of this year. Uh, and this patient, too, uh, will now go through those similar assessments. I'm also really excited to say that we've actually have been really trying to focus on more quantitative clinical endpoints. Uh, and to that end, we've partnered with a company called NeuroRPM. Uh, and we identified them because they have an FDA cleared mobile app for this AI powered remote monitoring on an Apple Watch uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease, where they can monitor both tremors and dyskinesia uh, uh, over many days at a time. Uh, and so both patients uh, will. The first patient has already started using this app. Uh, the second patient will start as well. And so we're already beginning to collect data around tremors and dyskinesia events uh, while on omovaloxalone. Uh, and I'm also really pleased to say that we've entered into a collaboration agreement with NeuroRPM uh, and have talked to them uh, particularly about the opportunity to broaden the use of this uh, app, if you will, across Lee syndrome patients uh, as a form of a potential natural history study. And so uh, we'll continue to uh, partner very closely with uh, Casey and Cura Mito, uh, and Dr. Kayani, but also now bring, I think, neuro RPM into the fold. Uh, and, you know, we are just at the very earliest days of this, but I think really excited to be incorporating uh, what hopefully will be a very quantitative measure with regard to a clinical endpoint. Uh, we are also in discussions here at Transcripta Bio uh, about planning a phase two study and, and also uh, talking to Biogen about doing that as well as Biogen owns uh, now uh, Sky Claris when they uh, acquired Riata Pharmaceuticals. And I think real, the real opportunity here is uh, in the context of a phase two study uh, would be aiming to leverage the regulatory flexibility that is just as was done with omovaloxalone in Friedrich's ataxia, uh, try to go after a one well-controlled study plus confirmatory evidence at the pharmacodynamic biomarker level as a means to get to a registrational uh, approval. Uh, and so we are very busy here uh, sort of working out the logistics around uh, what it would take to enable a phase two study. Um, I think what's wonderful about this opportunity, of course, is that Cure Mito has already put together a patient registry of, of many patients. Uh, natural history studies have already been done. Obviously, we have the, the, this evidence already from this one patient. Uh, and so I think we're really uh, on the precipice of uh, moving into uh, a new phase here with omovaloxone and, and Lee syndrome. So um, I'll stop there and just again want to thank uh, Casey and Cura Mido so very much for the partnership, uh, Dr. Kayani as well, uh, and look forward to uh, continuing to move this forward. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, very